Hello, everyone. Welcome to another IR capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, we'll discuss the most recent visit of President Joe Biden to the Middle East. Middle East, or West Asia as we call it, is a very important part of the world for the United States. And when normally presidents are elected, in the first year itself, he goes to at least Israel, if not to several other Middle Eastern countries. But President Biden did not have the time to do so because he was preoccupied with many things as soon as he became president. And uh, Indo-Pacific was became one of his uh, concerns. Then the pandemic affected the United States very badly. Then the Ukraine war was involved the United States in a direct confrontation with Russia together with NATO. So because of all these, he was neglecting the Middle East a little bit. And therefore, he must have noticed that the countries in the Middle East are seeking new friends and new alliances in the region. And particularly, China and Russia were making inroads into the Middle East. And at the same time, with the Ukraine war, President Biden is preoccupied with two things. One, prices of oil, and the other is the inflation in the United States. So to meet these requirements of first having to reduce the oil prices, basically to deprive Russia of exporting oil to many countries. And second was inflation in the United States for which some actions had to be taken. Trade had to be improved, balanced, and so on. So that is why, though it was a little late, President Biden made this visit to the Middle East. Of course, the first place he went was Israel, with Israel, United States has very close relationship. In fact, the strongest relationship between two countries, if you want to see, that is the United States and Israel. Israel has a new prime minister, and that also was a reason for him to, him to visit. So in Israel, his mission was basically to recommit himself, recommit the United States to the security of Israel. That's an absolute, uh, what shall we say, concrete arrangement between the two countries. And Israel depends on the United States. So United, Israel itself is a military, militarily strong nation, but it has the full support of the United States. So that every president has to restate it. And that was his main purpose. There was also another purpose, because as you know, negotiations have been taking place between Europeans and Iran on the nuclear deal, which was uh, rejected by President Trump. So this uh, joint action program, which was created under that treaty, has ceased to exist. And there have been discussions, both sides are willing to renew it or sign a new agreement. And therefore, they have been engaged in a dialogue for quite some time, more than a year now, in Vienna. But uh, this has not made much progress. We don't know what the difficulties are. But uh, it does not seem to have reached. We had reports earlier that they were reaching some kind of conclusion. Uh, but later, obviously, there were differences. Iranians brought up new issues, etc. We don't know the details, but we know that uh, the talks are suspended and they are unable to resume it. Uh, so he wanted to give a clear message to Iran that this is not something that United States or Israel can accept. So in the case of the Middle Eastern countries, Israel is the most opposed to Iran, and Iran is also wants the disintegration of Israel. So, and therefore, he wanted to isolate Iran. And the best place to do it is to go to Israel and to say that uh, we remain committed to Iran not making nuclear weapons. And this is Israel's desire also. So there was a joint statement there uh, in which Israel and the United States stated that under no circumstances will we allow Iran to become a nuclear weapon state. So that's a clear signal so that if they think that they can get away without an agreement, that will be dangerous for them. That was the message. And Israel agreed with it. But there was a difference between Israel's perspective of Iran 
and India's, sorry, uh, United States perspective. United States wants to resolve this peacefully. At any cost, it has to be done peacefully and not to use force or not to have to use force. Israel's view is that Iran will never agree to a diplomatic agreement and therefore a threat of use of force must be advanced. And Israel pressed that with Mr. Biden. Mr. Biden had no intention to do that. He's already in the middle of a war and he did not want to threaten Iran with a war. He simply said that this will not be allowed and therefore the sooner you agree to an agreement, the better. And that message went out, but Israel said that this is not a practical way. We must threaten the use of force. And finally, Mr. Biden said, well, as a last resort. So there also there was an agreement. And another thing that happened when President Biden was in Israel was the first, that is the inaugural meeting of what is called I2U2. This is not new. There was already uh, another quad. You know, after the Indo-Pacific Quad, there was something called the Western Quad, which uh, included uh, United States and India, and also Israel and the UAE. Such a combination was unthinkable a few years ago. Imagine Israel and UAE sitting in the same uh, grouping, and uh, India and US also in that group was something unthinkable in the past. But after the Abraham Accords, as you know, um, several uh, Arab countries have normalized relations with uh, Israel and particularly UAE. And UAE is playing a major role in that grouping. So it could be called a quad, but they decided to call it um, I2 and U2. I means two in I's, that is India and Israel, and two U's, United States and UAE. Very clever name for it. Um, but the but this quad, this Western quad or this I2, um, U2, it is uh, basically an economic grouping. And uh, it's not impossible that it may assume a certain security uh, angles, but the moment it doesn't have. What they have mentioned is uh, energy development, investment, uh, food security, energy security, etc. So very vital uh, issues. And uh, since it was the first meeting, they outlined the activities they want to undertake. And there is also a desire or a wish at least by some people that Egypt uh, should join later and uh, Saudi Arabia should join later. So if they also join, it will be a really a very comprehensive uh, grouping in the Middle East. But that has not happened yet. And therefore they discussed various things. And one specific project which was approved there was between UAE and India, because food security is one of the important elements of I2U2. And therefore, uh, UAE came up with a proposal that they are willing to invest 2 billion US dollars in India uh, to build a chain of what they call integrated food uh, projects. Various things must be canning and storing and various other things um, in India. And that is a specific proposal they made, but the other proposals will come. This was just a beginning. So a new quad, you know, United States is now engaged in a kind of quad diplomacy, one in Indo-Pacific, now one in the Middle East. And they have already got someone in something in the, in the Central Asia also. So already there are two quads available but uh, they have changed the name of this one into I2U2. So this was a, a major thing that happened into the, at the time of the visit to Israel. And of course, the usual affirmation of support to each other and uh, ironclad guarantee for the security of Israel from the uh, United States. So Israel, of course, there was never any doubt about their uh, close friendship. And therefore, it was reasserted and reaffirmed. And that was, of course, there was nothing unexpected there. In fact, there was a merit in having this new group launched. Then even before he went, left the United States on this visit, there was some kind of apprehension whether he should go to Saudi Arabia at this point. Uh, the reasons are several. One is that Saudi Arabia in the last two years or so has been building bridges with both Russia and China. 
apart from among the GCC countries and three others in the same region. And uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, has also been reforming. They have been changing their laws, more liberal, liberal attitudes towards women, uh, new uh, laws which protect the citizens, etc. And the, and the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, has been a very powerful force. He is uh, not only the number two man, but also defense minister. And he has risen as a major uh, personality, not only in the, in the Gulf, not only in Saudi Arabia, but also in the whole world, because he's very famous for his uh, various uh, views, reform of uh, Saudi Arabia itself, and relationships, because he has been fighting a war in Yemen. Um, and generally, he was flexing his muscles, and people are very careful with him. And uh, United States was unhappy with him because they believe that uh, Jalal Khashoggi's uh, murder, that famous journalist who was killed in Istanbul, uh, was ordered personally by the Crown Prince. And this, President Biden had repeated in several uh, pronouncements because uh, the, according to the American investigation, this man was brought into the UAE consulate in Saudi consulate in uh, Istanbul and was murdered there under the orders from the Crown Prince. So this, of course, the Crown Prince denies. And uh, he also says that uh, he has punished uh, those who are responsible. And we know that some people have been sentenced to death. Uh, but still, this suspicion still continues. And uh, therefore, would the president raise this issue when he goes to Saudi Arabia? And if he raises it, what would be the reaction? And therefore, there was some anxiety about that. Several commentators said, this is not the time for you to visit Saudi Arabia. But it was very important from the point of view of increasing oil production. So Saudi Arabia is key to that. And also for inflation to be controlled, uh, Saudi Arabia has a big role because of the prices of products they import, and the arms and ammunition, and so on. So President Biden risked it. He decided to go in spite of these uh, hesitations. But he went and came back. The criticism was the opposite. The criticism was, why were you so friendly with the Crown Prince? Because when they met, they, you know, the fist, because they don't shake hands because of the pandemic. So the, 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 the familiar way of greeting each other is to hit the fist against each other. And uh, President Biden did that, it showed great camaraderie, great friendship, and the uh, atmosphere was very pleasant. And that was criticized when he came back to India. But regardless of that, um, President Biden says, after he came back, after the visit, he said, he raised the question of Khashoggi, and um, there was no crisis. The Crown Prince told him very politely that he was not responsible for it, and uh, they had committed they had punished those who were responsible, and they want, he wanted to close that discussion. But also he told the president, according to the president himself, that this is not the only country where such things have happened, uh, suggesting that you know people have been killed in the United States also. And he also mentioned the, a prison in Iraq, where some people sympathetic to the Americans were housed, and some people broke into that and killed many people. So he mentioned an Iraqi prison. So in other words, he said, I did not do that, but uh, this is nothing unusual and therefore it should not be given undue importance. And as far as the other issue is concerned, uh, the Crown Prince was very clear that they were not in a position to increase production of oil. Because they said that this has to be done in consultation with our customers, um, like, uh, like China, and several other countries, and therefore we cannot increase production suddenly. And uh, President Biden's point was that uh, by increasing production, Russia will not be able to uh, export oil to other countries, and therefore their war effort will suffer. So that he did not get any promise. They said that they would try and uh, consult others and come to a conclusion. So in that sense, his visit to Saudi Arabia was not fully totally successful. And, um, and then uh, there also, he, he had a meeting with what is called GCC plus three. 
three other non-GCC countries. And uh, he briefed them about American policy in the Middle East and urged them to solve problems among themselves and uh, try and be a, a, a force in the world. And the United States would support them, that kind of a message he gave. But the impression he got was that they were keeping all their options open. They were not willing to commit anything uh, against Russia or China because of the changing situation in the world. They said they would continue their reform program and uh, more open and friendly. And everything was promised, but on the oil and on the inflation issue, we did not make, get much, uh, uh, shall we say, success. But then this should not be uh, uh, you know, assessed on the basis of uh, uh, specific achievements, because this was a beginning. Middle East was neglected for more than about two years, and it was very essential for the president and to go there and establish the credentials of the uh, United States as a friend of the Middle East. So it was a beginning, and we can expect that the relationship with Saudi Arabia, as well as the I2U2, will be further strengthened as a result uh, of his visit. But when he went back, he faced a phenomenon that he has become less popular in the United States. You know, in the polls, by the time, that means the people of the United States did not consider his visit to be, uh, uh, to be successful. And therefore, his rating as president went down. Inflation went high. And also the projection that Democrats might lose the election, lose the by-election, and lose the majority in the Congress. And that was also came out when he went back. So it was a kind of setback for him after the visit. So we can say half empty or half full. It was not a fully successful visit. It was overdue. And uh, he, he played his cards very well. He did not make an issue of the Khashoggi issue, but he mentioned it. I don't know in what form he mentioned it. Uh, but uh, his answer was, when he was asked whether he mentioned this case, he said, how can any, pre any president of the United States not re erase issues of human rights? They're fundamental to us. So regardless of what, whatever country, whatever our friendship, when it comes to human rights issues, no American president can keep quiet. Of course, that's the argument that they use in the case of India also. As you know, the Democrats have been raising issues about human rights in India. Even when we have very good uh, meetings, at the end of the meeting, they will raise something about how Muslims are treated or how scheduled tribes are treated, etc. And their defense is that their constitution has asked them to keep an eye on human rights issues around the world. Of course, they are very critical of China, they are very critical of Pakistan and many other countries, Cuba, etc. But in, uh, even in other countries where democratic countries, they do raise this issue. So he said, I could not have ra avoided raising it. And there was a risk that the Crown Prince would be offended by it. He was not. He was quite, uh, uh, you know, he was quite okay uh, with the, with the um, remarks he made. So if you ask me, it was a, a partial success. And certainly a good beginning, uh, which would mark a closer relationship between uh, United States and the Middle East countries. And also the other uh, agenda is to increase the support, increase the normalization of relations between Israel and the Arab countries. And that also is on the card. Saudi Arabia has not done anything yet. There are other countries. But Saudi Arabia has encouraged other countries like UAE to normalize relations, so which means that Saudi Arabia might also um, you know, normalize relations with Israel. So in that way, he has given a push to that agenda also. And therefore, it was, a, I would say, a useful visit, though we cannot say it was highly successful. Thank you. Because they are the biggest enemies. Iran does not recognize Israel, and its agenda is to destroy, destroy Israel. Of course, that was the agenda of most of the Arab countries also. But others have uh, relaxed. Uh, but Iran, 
uh, certainly believes that Israel is a terrorist state and uh, they, have, they will have no relationship. And so uh, that's why Israel is very angry with Iran also. And they believe that uh, Iran is uh, supporting several armed militias like Hezbollah and, uh, and others in the occupied territories you know, on the West Bank and Gaza and also uh, in other parts of the world. So they believe that Iran is doing all this to destroy Israel. And also they have a more realistic understanding of Iran because the United States thinks that you can negotiate with Iran, uh, but obviously uh, not possible. And so that is why they are so inimical to each other. That's impossible. The relationship with Iran is uh, not at all normal. Um, you, soon after the uh, sign, the, the deal was nuclear deal was signed. It was supposed to be normalized, and uh, sanctions there are very heavy sanctions against Iran uh, from the United States. And uh, they said that they will implement the deal only after the sanctions are lifted. And the Americans said, no, 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 you should. Uh, um, you know, Americans said that you should stop all nuclear activities according to the deal. But then when President Trump came and he said, why only for 15 years? After 15 years, what? So we need to renegotiate. So he withdrew from that agreement, saying that there's a stupid agreement and therefore they are trying to find a, a new uh, deal. And if the deal is satisfactory for the United States, uh, then the san uh, sanctions will be lifted from Iran. Iran will be able to sell oil and other things to the rest of the world, which they are suffering on account of that. And that is why Iran is willing to negotiate. So India, US-Iran relations are not at all normal. In fact, US has been asking us whether we can help in negotiating with Iran. But then they themselves are negotiating with each other. And also in the negotiations in, the, in Vienna on this agreement it is going on. So, but the person who visited Iran was Putin. In the middle of this war, uh, President Putin was there a couple of days after President Biden returned from the region. So giving an indication that Russia is with Iran, Iran and therefore the friends of Iran in the Middle East will be supportive of it. So that continues. Well, we have raised it. They would, of course, deny it. In fact, uh, Foreign Minister, when he was in the US, he was asked about human rights questions in, the, in India. And uh, he immediately said, but uh, we have reasons to believe that human rights situation in the US is also not very, very good. And he mentioned specifically human rights violations of the people of Indian origin in the United States. That we have never said before. But as you know, Mr. Jay Shankar is very combative. So he not only said that we'll take care of our people, we will consider their human rights grievances, if any, uh, but don't think that the United States is not guilty of human rights violations, to which they did not give an answer officially. So you can say they cannot reject it. They can only say that we will inquire investigate. And that is what they expect us to do. When they make these complaints to us, what they mean is, we must investigate and let us know what happened to these cases. They actually write to us about specific cases of harassment of minorities, etc. And then we are supposed to investigate and send them a report. And that's exactly what they, what we expect from them also. Yes, so this is the, that's why I said the visit was not fully successful. Uh, because his mission was basically the two things which did not work. And also, his own people are not happy with this bump, fist bump. So, that also is a minor matter, but assumes importance in this kind of things. So, well, he, he has to rebuild it, and he will do it after his immediate preoccupation, immediate preoccupation is to end the Ukraine war. He has to develop a policy towards China. These are the most crucial things he has to do immediately. And then the elections in November, and he's already thinking of contesting for presidency after four years. He has lots of things to do. So in the process, he will also try to 
improve the standing of the United States in the, in the Middle East. Well, so that is a divisive issue. Why should we go into it? You know, we have a large number of Shias in India, and that explains our relationship, good relationship with Iran, apart from historical and otherwise. So the Shia Sunni conflict is an old conflict in uh, the Middle East, and it'll continue forever, and we never intervene in that, or even talk about it, uh, because there's something, a problem in the Arab world, and uh, we do not try to negotiate or mediate in this respect. And so that, that issue does not come up. Arab world, our relationship is basically one of supporting the Palestinians. That has been a, an act of faith by India, right from Mahatma Gandhi days through Jawaharlal Nehru. Even the present government is quite friendly to the Palestinians. And even the Americans are trying to help the Palestinians to rebuild that particular area, that's the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, but Israel, of course, opposes it very seriously. So, but we support the Palestinians, that has not changed. And also we have fairly good trade with these countries. The UAE is the, is the biggest trading partner of India, maybe after the, after the US, or maybe sometimes even more than the US. And the projects are there, we are very supportive of the Arab countries. And we have very deep relations with Arab countries. At that time, of course, we didn't have good relations with Israel, but now we have good relations with Israel also. So we are quite safe in the, in the Middle East. No, he didn't go for Iran talk. Iran talk is going on in Vienna between the two delegations, not only United States, but also European countries. So he didn't go to Iran. But um, because the agreement is not being reached, he wanted to warn Iran, together with Israel, that they will not allow Iran to manufacture nuclear weapons, whether they sign the agreement or not. So there, there was a threat there. And that is why he went to uh, Israel. And also in other countries, also he must have spoken about Iran. But uh, Iran has friends in the, in, the, in the Middle East. And so that has to be also balanced. Yes, this was agreed long ago. It was announced as a Western Quad. So they must have weighed all these considerations, having these four countries, which are all in different, uh, uh, different groups, and their coming together was a welcome move. And therefore, we, we joined it already. Only the name changed. And uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, kept pronouncing it very correctly, I too, you too. So uh, he has embraced it. Thank you.